the member for Western Arctic. Come have it, Dennis. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for uh, this opportunity to speak to this uh, Maritime Liability Act amendments. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, in my, in my research so far on this particular subject, it appears that, you know, this, this, this uh, legislation is, has been on the books for consideration for some time. Uh, May 2005, Transport Canada put forward a maritime law Re de uh, law reform discussion paper in which they they put forward many of the points that are in in this bill. Many of these uh, protocols have been in existence, as we pointed out, since 1976, uh, 1992, 2001, 2003, and they haven't been ratified. Many of the aspects within them have been implemented within the marine. Uh, Liability Act in one form or the other. So, so we've seen that Canada over the years has taken uh, from international marine liability uh, work, international conventions, and has implemented into its legislation, but has not uh, ratified the actual conventions in many cases it's themselves. So, so this is this is a law that's a, that's that's going to. Uh, amendments to the law that's going to bring things up to date. And, uh, you know, under the Constitution of Canada, Parliament has the exclusive authority to make laws in relation to navigation and shipping. But the provincial legislatures have the exclusive legislative authority to make laws in relation to property and to civil rights. So this is this, uh, worth keeping in mind, this division of powers, because it does play out in terms of the of of some of the issues around liability and some of the issues that are important, uh, you know, in this bill. When, when we consider what the bill has done under Part 4 of the Act to, to, uh, to set a per capita limit of liability uh, uh, that would uh, that r limit this liability for the carriage of passengers and, particular the, the treatment of participants in adventure tourism activities and that mr. speaker is something that uh, you know was of great concern in the act before from from uh, from adventure tourism operators in 1992 you know uh, legislation under the Mar marine uh, uh, liability act caused the uh, the the waivers that were used for for many of the adventure tourism people in their in their businesses, uh, the waivers they used to limit their liability for their for their customers who were engaged in in recreational activities that were some some degree of hazard were were not were were made invalid. This law now attempts to bring those back so that these waivers for the adventure tourism sector are can be can be used and, and are valid and and this is a very important uh, thing and will certainly will be a subject of of discussion at committee when this bill moves forward as we we would like to see it move forward it's been many years in 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 getting to this point and i think you know we can blame if there's blame we can blame previous administration the liberal government obviously they they uh they uh they formulated the maritime law reform discussion paper to, uh, to uh, you know, with the, with the questions that were carried out, uh, you know, at that time, and we can see that uh, many of these these uh, these conventions not ratified over many many years that they're in place. So obviously, you know, governments have been slow at moving on this, and I, I'd like to you know, in committee, understand why governments have been slow and, and get to get to why this hasn't happened in in a fashion that, you know, would have provided some of the protections that are now being put forward, uh, and that, that may clear the air in, in, in much of this regard. Other, other parts of the, the Act uh, will amend Part 6 of the Act to implement protocol for the International Convention and the Establishment of the International Fund for the Compensation for Oil Pollution Damage, uh, as well as the International Convention on Civil Liability for Bunker Oil Pollution Damage. Uh, uh, it, it will uh, change the liability regime of the ship source oil pollution fund. It, it'll do a number of things that will will change the way uh, 
major pollution, major things like oil spills in our waters are handled. But the, will it actually provide the protections required? Interestingly enough, the uh, parliamentary secretary indicated that the, the fund that uh, is established would provide perhaps a billion and a half dollars towards oil spill remediation. When we look at the Exxon Valdez, we see that the total cost of the Exxon Valdez 20 years ago was, uh, and onward was some $2.5 billion. So even within the context of what we're putting forward here, we have examples of accidents that have cost, cost more to clean up than what would be available under this fund. And the fund, interestingly enough, is, is a fund where if, there, if it's drawn down, it will have to be replenished by, the, by states that import oil on a levy basis. So there, this is not a, this is not a, and within the, within the act, there's various considerations about who is going to be liable, what, what condition the liability will extend to the owner, what conditions the, the owner will, will find themselves uh, without the, the wherewithal to provide the compensation to the people that have the, the oil spill damage. So this is a complex business that we're entering into under this act with these conventions. And I'm certainly, uh, I'll, I'll look forward to uh, having the opportunity to have expert witnesses come before us and, and, and present their case for these conventions. These conventions haven't been adopted quickly by, by our government. They uh, they ha we've been operating under a particular regime for, for some, some considerable time. Now, when it comes to oil spills, and I brought this up the other day, we don't have, in, in the case of the Arctic waters, we don't have the capacity or the ability to deal with oil spills in waters that have more than 35% ice content. We can't deal with them. We cannot get the oil out of the water with the present technology. So when, when we talk about the development of the Arctic and the Arctic waters and bringing in more ships, bringing in more uh, activity, commercial activity, drilling rigs, uh, service vessels, uh, transshipping through the, the Northwest Passage, which even when it's ice free is a very uh, uh, dangerous passageway. It's not a, it's not a, uh, you know, this is not uh, wide open ocean. This is this is shallow, shallow uh, areas with with uh, with much of the charting that's not c conventionally carried by ships. So we we have uh, we have a significant concern in the Arctic about what's going to happen with shipping in there. We don't have the capacity to deal with oil spills in waters that are that are that are ice that are that are that have a great percentage of ice uh, in them and th that's the kind of water that we're going to see ships going through. So, so when we talk about Canada's ability to act in an environmental sense, as the parliamentary su secretary suggested, this bill is going to somehow deal with the environment and protect us, protect the environment from, from uh, uh, damage. In reality, what it does is just simply uh, assign costs to 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 uh, in a, in 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 a, in a variety of ways to to either funds that are internationally set up to provide uh, uh, or to uh, provide uh, mechanisms to to identify and to to make uh, the uh, uh, the ship owners that cause the spill responsible for that. So so we have a have a situation. It's not really a this is not really an environmental bill. This is a bill about, about who's, who's going to be responsible. And we already have some, some provisions in our acts to, to, to uh, certainly deal with some of those, those aspects. So when we, when we come to actually examining this bill, do we want to push ahead with all speed on these provisions, or do we want to understand completely what they're going to mean to us uh, as, as a country, uh, in relationship to the to the vast uh, uh, o uh, ocean and and coast areas we have 
from sea to sea to sea in Canada. These are, these are all issues that, of course, we want to make sure that we cover in, in great detail as, as this bill moves forward. And this is to, for that purpose, of course, we're, we're quite interested in seeing this bill move forward to second reading, to, to take the time, and this, this is not going to be a, a, a slam dunk affair to deal with this, with this bill in committee. This is, this is a bill that has uh, a variety of ramifications, has been around for, for a considerable period of time where it hasn't come forward. We want to understand why that's the case, what are the particular aspects of, of these international conventions that are positive, and what are the things that, that may not be as, as we want to have for, for our country. Mr. Speaker, it's, uh, it's a bill that uh, uh, we need. We need to work on this. I'm sure that uh, all of the people in the Transport Committee, as we move forward with this bill, will be, will be, uh, will be looking forward to, to having that time. Uh, we do have, a, as my colleague from the block on, on our committee pointed out, this is the fourth bill that's come. It's, it's working its way through the system in the Transport Committee. We will have to set priorities for handling these bills, making sure that they move forward. But uh, at the same time, we can't ignore the details of such an important bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker.